this morning we're very excited to be hearing from Dr. Joshua Brody. Uh, Dr. Brody earned his medical degree at SUNY Stony Brook School of Medicine and completed residency training in internal medicine at Yale University, followed by fellowship training in hematology and oncology at Stanford University in California. He joined the faculty at Mount Sinai in 2011 and currently serves as an assistant professor in the Division of Hematology and Oncology of the Department of Medicine. In addition to his robust clinical work, he's the director of the Lymphoma Immunotherapy Program of the Tisch Cancer Institute, where he and his team have worked to develop numerous novel and innovative immunotherapies for the treatment of lymphomas as well as other solid tumors. A very warm welcome to Dr. Joshua Brody. Jim, good morning. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, kind and generous introduction. Uh, and for taking a, uh, some time out of your day, I, clearly you're in a skyscraper up in uh, Northeast Harlem. So uh, I, I appreciate your taking some time. They're and, wired uh, for own technology. It's, it's incredible. Uh, I similarly am going to start with um, uh, some data on my first slide here to clarify, uh, I would say, irrefutable evidence that uh, New York City is paradise on earth, uh, if seen from the right angle. Uh, we tried every single angle. This was the right angle. There was no other angle from which New York appeared to be heaven on earth. And so we like to start here to remind us of how lucky we are. Um, and I'm very lucky to have everyone joining us today. Uh, a lot of uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, I'm very lucky to even have my primary care physician uh, on the call today. And for the purposes of medical confidentiality, I can't reveal uh, that she is Yan Hee Cha. So I have to just keep that um, uh, as an unknown and a mystery to all of you. So thank you all for joining. Uh, I'm gonna talk about lymphoma immunotherapy. I'm gonna talk about cancer immunotherapy. I'm gonna make it extremely relatable uh, and explain why this is important for all of our patients with lymphoma, all of our patients with cancer, and really for, like, for all of us because cancer impacts all of our lives uh, as you're all well aware. Um, so I tried to answer some of these important and critical questions um, and they were being reviewed by some millennial members of my lab. So I tried to answer them in millennial, why lymphoma, why lymphoma immunotherapy? Uh, because it's the best disease in which to study cancer immunotherapy. I'll explain why that's the case. Really, it's because we get some things working and it's only when you have some, some things working can you then uh, expand uh, those learned lessons to other disease types. And lymphoma immunotherapy, we have a lot of things working. So now we have the chance to expand those things to every other kind of cancer. Why cancer immunotherapy? This one is from the voice of a millennial. <laughs> of a millennial. Seriously, because it won a Nobel Prize and it's in all the tweets. And thankfully, cancer immunotherapy has transformed the lives of our patients um, significantly over the past 10 years and absolutely unquestionably even more so over the, uh, over the next 10 years. Um, and why cancer immunotherapy, uh, which cancer immunotherapies, we're gonna talk about all of them briefly because they all have some uh, real proof of principle in lymphoma. Uh, and so we can take those uh, learned lessons uh, beyond. Um, uh, more specifically, why cancer immunotherapy? Uh, we have many types of cancer immunotherapy, certainly the one that has gotten the most attention deservedly so uh, is checkpoint blockade, uh, most critically in terms of our patients impact uh, PD-1 blockade. We have a number of antibodies that are FDA approved that block either PD-1 or it's ligand PD-L1. And this uh, therapy, this group of therapies in America helps many tens of thousands of patients every year. But I wanna give you just some perspective of that. Here are the 10 most common cancers in America. You're all uh, well aware of the first four most common cancers, breast, lung, prostate, and colon cancer. Uh, really, the fifth most common cancer is lymphoma, but when we fractionate it into non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it becomes number seven. And we have certainly some impact of PD-1 blockade in some of these tumor types, most notably lung cancer uh, and melanoma are, are the places in which we you know, help the greatest number of people. So the blue bars are the incidence of these cancers, breast cancer, profoundly high incidence, uh, uh, these other ones still extremely high. And yet with most of these most common cancers, the response rate to PD-1 blockade is actually extremely small. And so for most common patients with breast, prostate, colon cancer, uh, PD-1 blockade is not a standard therapy. There are some small subsets, triple negative breast cancer uh, has FDA approved PD-1 blockade. Uh, and most of these patients who are responding uh, to PD-1 blockade with breast cancer are these triple negative breast cancer patients. But the common cancers in which we are really helping people are lung cancer, melanoma, and some of the GU cancers, bladder and kidney cancer especially. You'll see a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma specifically, uh, PD-1 blockade profoundly ineffective that's in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I'll give a counterpoint to that in just a second. Uh, anyway, these therapies, although they're helping many people, as you can see, a lot more blue on this slide than red. So that blue is room for improvement. 
and a profound amount of room for improvement uh, in cancer immunotherapies. But you know, these reds were, <laughs> this slide was basically all blue 10 years ago. So the fact that we put all this red on the board is a, is a remarkable impact and more impact, uh, I would say, than any other advance in cancer immunotherapy uh, in the past 50 years, certainly. Um, specifically in lymphoma, I mentioned non-Hodgkin's lymphomas do not respond to PD-1 blockade broadly, um, but we have a beautiful exception uh, in lymphoma in, in which Hodgkin's lymphomas are not only responsive to PD-1 blockade, but they are the most responsive tumor and also a bit neglected because they are not as common as melanoma, lung cancer, kidney and bladder cancer. So whereas melanoma helps about 40% of patients with melanoma, uh, with PD-1 blockade helps about 40% of patients with melanoma, uh, the response rate in Hodgkin's lymphoma is higher than it is in any other tumor, about 70% response rate. Many of those are complete responses. Many of those responses last for years and they may last forever because we um, are still following those patients and many of them are in durable remissions. And this is a big deal for us. This is um, not just science and not just medicine. This is um, emotionally big deal for us because as you know, these Hodgkin's patients are frequently some 22 year old kids that you know were taking a semester off college, thought they were perfectly healthy, had a lump. And then we're frequently told for no one's fault that don't worry about it. We're gonna cure you with standard therapy, chemotherapy because chemotherapy does cure the majority of Hodgkin's. It cures even you know 75% of advanced stage Hodgkin's that still leaves you know, those 25% of, of kids who were told something, they were told they were gonna to be cured uh, and chemotherapy didn't do it. And then uh, frequently uh, bone marrow transplant as a salvage therapy uh, doesn't cure them. And then they were told, well, okay, you know, I'm sorry for what we told you, but now you have an incurable disease. Uh, and here you are, you know, just what you thought, taking a semester off college. PD-1 blockade got FDA approved for Hodgkin's lymphoma now five years ago. And for those kids, it has been transformational. Many of those, um, people are in uh, durable remissions. So an emotionally uh, impactful big deal for all of us uh, in oncology and a learning lesson there that uh, we can learn things from one type of tumor and bring those lessons to other types of cancer. Let me just uh, back uh, track one moment. Why lymphoma? Now that I'm telling you about lymphoma therapies and immunotherapies, let's just give a 101 about lymphoma. Uh, lymphoma is the fifth most common cancer after the big four I mentioned. And you know, it is significantly more prevalent than most of the other hematologic malignancies that we talk about, leukemia, myeloma, myelofibrosis. In terms of incidence, um, there are some close to comparable numbers of these other tumors, but these lymphoma patients accumulate because some of them can have long remissions and long lives. Some of them can be cured. Patients with CLL are generally not cured, but can live for many, many years. So we have a lot of lymphoma patients and therefore Everyone here knows somebody with lymphoma or CLL. We consider CLL a type of lymphoma. I know the name is confusing, but everyone here knows uh, somebody with lymphoma. Even if you don't know that you know somebody with lymphoma, you definitely know somebody with lymphoma. So it is a highly uh, prevalent disease. Uh, all of these folks have different types of lymphoma. We like to point out that, not ironically, Mr. T ended up with T-cell lymphoma, but he's doing well. He had a pretty small cutaneous lymphoma, uh, but we all know somebody with lymphoma and therefore we uh, need to have better uh, and uh, mechanistically distinct therapies for these patients. We have many, many approved um, FDA approved therapies for lymphoma. And this is actually more than any other type of cancer, more than even breast cancer. Breast cancer has 42 FDA approved therapies and we use different therapies for every type of lymphoma. So it's not redundant and Personally, lymphoma is interesting to me because this non-Hodgkin's lymphoma group specifically is not one type of cancer. There are 74 types of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. So we have to actually get the right therapies for the right patients uh, with the right lymphoma types. So back to lymphoma immunotherapy, as I say, we're very lucky uh, to have success stories, not enough, but still success stories, proof of principle uh, for almost every type of immunotherapy. And we can bring these lessons to other tumor types. So one of the recent success stories, as everyone I think is familiar with, it, things called CAR T cells, CAR meaning chimeric antigen receptor, chimeric antigen receptor, meaning it's a chimera, partly a B cell receptor. We also call it immunoglobulin or an antibody and partly a T cell receptor, really the signaling part of a T cell receptor. So we put this CAR into a T cell and we call it a CAR T cell. I won't go through CAR 101. The punchline of it is we have patients these are PET scans of a couple different patients with aggressive diffuse large cell lymphoma uh, who were completely refractory to all standard therapies, chemo, stem cell transplants, et cetera. Uh, and after CAR T cell therapy, they'd had these profound remissions that were lasting for months and years 
uh, after the completion. This is just some, some of the early data from almost a decade ago now. Um, and then in the larger trials, this is uh, data from the Zuma-1 first FDA approval of CAR T cells for lymphoma. And we see uh, response rates above 80%. So this is incredible for patients that have really failed every other type of therapy. Uh, and those responses, uh, many of them complete remissions, uh, were fairly long lasting. And we see uh, patients here who are more than a year out, most of the patients in this trial now, uh, and still had not relapsed. We say these patients are cured. We have to follow them for more years, but it seems that the shape of this Kaplan-Meier curve has really plateaued. So we think that about 35 or 40% of these otherwise incurable uh, tumors were cured by this therapy. So this comes up every day for us uh, in lymphoma clinic because many of our lymphomas are called incurable. Uh, when my grandpa's sister was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma in 1948, they, they, they called it incurable. And now of course we call it mostly curable. We called third line DLBCL, diffuse large cell lymphoma incurable uh, in 2015. And now we don't call it that anymore. So this is um, miraculous and I will say transformational uh, advances. Um, and I was instructed not only to put some pictures of celebrities in the slide mix, but also some cartoons uh, to keep people attentive. And we are making many advances uh, in CAR T cell therapy. We have these CAR T cells where we have souped up normal healthy T cells uh, with chimeric antigen receptors, but now we're making even more advances on how we can make these CAR T cells even more potent. They can deliver payloads uh, at the tumor site. Uh, and I won't go more into that today. That's all uh, happening now in the clinic, uh, but still a little ways from uh, uh, prime time. So uh, we have another version of a similar concept of how we can bring patients T cells over to their own tumor types and then activate those T cells to kill the tumor. So an example of this are bispecific antibodies. We actually have a somewhat older version of this that was already FDA approved for leukemia 15 years ago called blinitumumab, uh, but that has been a bit unwieldy and difficult to use. So we have a new generation of these now. We call them CD3, most of these that we call now CD3 by CD20 biospecifics, meaning they are antibodies uh, which bind to a lymphoma cell by virtue of its expression of CD20 and also bind to a T cell. And in binding, deliver an activation signal to that T cell. Uh, conceptually, that allows the T cell to release perforin granzyme, which goes on to kill that lymphoma cell. We have no um, FDA approved uh, biospecifics yet in 2020, but that will change in 2021. Because as you can see, we have some amazing uh, early response efficacy data for patients with low grade lymphoma with the vast majority having partial or complete remissions from some of these early bispecific antibodies and even patients with aggressive lymphoma, many of them with partial and complete remissions and even patients who have failed that last miraculous therapy I mentioned, CAR T cells, many of them having remissions. Um, the response rates here um, for various different platforms of bispecific antibodies uh, as you can see, ranged in the high 80s to 90s percent for low-grade lymphomas, uh, and even in the 60 and 70 percent uh, for some of the platforms for aggressive lymphomas. So a real advance, um, but still a lot of room for left for improvement, uh, as I hinted. So how do we make improvement? Well, really, the first answer of how do we improve is to try to understand the problem. And this is not about lymphoma immunotherapy. This is relevant for all cancer immunotherapies, that really the way that if we're going to ask uh, most, uh, if we're going to ask our own T cells, our own CD8 T cells specifically, to see a tumor associated antigen and kill that tumor, mostly the way that they're going to see that antigen is presented by MHC1 from the tumor cell itself. And that cannot activate these T cells. This is immunology 101, that signal one, just the provision uh, of the MHC and the cognate antigen to a T cell receptor provides one signal, we call it signal one, and signal one is not enough to activate T cells. Um, and, and that Immunology 101 really is happening in our patients every day. They have tumors. Those tumors are expressing antigens, many of them. The T cells are seeing them and they are not getting activated because signal one is not enough to activate a T cell. We need a consensus. We'll talk about signal one and two and three. Um, and this is a bit evident um, in some of the largest data from looking at patients treated with PD-1 blockade. So this is multiple tumor types of patients treated with PD-1 blockade. And we see some of those patients have great responses. These are patients with head and neck cancers and a few other tumor types. Some of these patients had com complete remissions that were ongoing for months and years. And the observation here from this great study from Dr. Ayers and his group uh, is that those patients tend to have tumors, which we say were inflamed. What does it mean inflamed? It means they looked at the whole transcriptome of those tumors and the patients with the responses tend to have more transcripts 
for inflammatory molecules like interferon gamma. So we call this an inflamed signature on this x-axis uh, here. Uh, and then you see certainly there's a correlation with the inflamed signature and good response. Sometimes the inflamed signature, we just call those hot tumors, hot tumors versus cold tumors. And hot tumors tend to respond better to PD-1 blockade. Uh, but here's the problem. Hot is not enough. This inflamed signature is not the cause of what makes this T cell kill this tumor cell. It is an epiphenomena. In fact, that's quite obvious even when you looked at this data. You see that the only patients with hot tumors do respond to PD-1 blockade. However, still the majority of these patients with hot tumors still don't respond. There's more black dots down here than there are red boxes up here. So hot is not enough. So what is enough? Again, it's back to trying to understand the problem. The problem is that we need to provide good activating signals to these T cells. What does that mean? That generally means that these T cells need to be activated not by a tumor presenting antigen, but by a professional antigen presenting cell. Professional, and, and, and this has been shown in many uh, high impact papers. Um, and so we're gonna talk about how we have thought about trying to get more of these uh, antigen presenting cells to the tumor site. So first we have to mobilize these antigen presenting cells and certainly the most famous group of them are called dendritic cells, and even it's a particular subset of dendritic cells that we think are critical here. So we need to mobilize dendritic cells, and in parallel, as I said, I'll say one way that we can accomplish this. We've been using a medicine called FLT3 ligand to mobilize dendritic cells. FLT3 ligand is the natural uh, growth and differentiation factor for all of us right now uh, to allow our dendritic cell precursors to become dendritic cells. So it's something that's uh, in us right now. We say it's just like the erythropoietin for red cells, GCSF for neutrophils, we're making FLT3 ligands to make dendritic cells. But just like those other examples, we can inject more of this recombinant FLT3 ligand uh, into patients. So we need to mobilize dendritic cells. We need to load those dendritic cells with tumor antigens. There's lots of ways that we could do that, but we're gonna talk about one way, which is just local radiotherapy, very simple. Kill a few tumor cells, allow those tumor antigens to be taken up by these antigen presenting cells. And then we need to activate those antigen presenting cells. Lots of ways to do this, uh, but one way that won the Nobel Prize in 2011 is the use of toll-like receptor agonists. Toll-like receptors are powerful activating switches on many cell types, but especially on dendritic cells. So once we have these APCs, they can provide signal one, as we talked about, but they can also provide signal two. These are things like B7, CD80, CD86, things that hit CD28 on a T cell to provide that signal two. And signal three, we described as the many different cytokines um, that dendritic cells can release, uh, things like interleukin-12. So if we get this concordant signal one, two, three to activate T cells, they will really get activated. They will proliferate and can go and induce systemic anti-tumor effects. And we make some distinction that the type of priming of these T cells is called direct priming versus cross priming or cross presentation of the antigen uh, by, the, by the dendritic cell. So the point there is that cross presentation is critical if we want tumor antigens to get presented to T cells. And the only way to get cross presentation is through this bizarre and magical process. Let me just describe it to you very quickly. I will only do this brief description of, again, Immunology 101. If we're gonna have an antigen that comes from outside an antigen presenting cell, like a tumor antigen, it has to get taken up. And the normal pathway for the exogenous antigens is for them to get taken up uh, into endoplasmic reticulum and then expressed onto uh, MHC class two, which can get presented to, those antigens can get presented to CD4 T cells. That's great, but CD4 T cells we think are generally not enough for good anti-tumor effects. If we want to get these exogenous antigens presented on MHC class one, they have to do this bizarre magical thing, which is cross an oil and water barrier. They have to get out of this uh, vesicle. This could be an endosome or even an endolysosome now. They have to get into the cytosol, uh, taken in through the protosome uh, into the R, loaded onto class one, and then presented on the surface of class one, two uh, CD8 T cells. We call this a magical process because we don't really understand how all of these antigens that were exogenous can get from this topological space into the cytosolic topological space. Although we don't understand it perfectly, we know something about it, which is that it can only be accomplished by a rare subset of cells. Uh, and the best at accomplishing are not even all dendritic cells, but this subset called bad F3 dendritic cells. And the reason we believe that is over the past 12 years, we've had a series of papers in these incredibly high impact journals over and over again, showing that when we get rid of bad F3 dendritic cells, all the efficacy of every type of cancer immunotherapy is lost. And we've seen this over and over again, when we get rid of bad F3 dendritic cells, um, uh, adoptive T cells, uh, checkpoint blockade the vaccines all become ineffective. And the concept there is that, you know, we have these T cells that we, you know, we've been asked to do the job of how to kill cancer. 
And one way we've, we've helped them to do that is to give them PD-1 blockade so they won't be as exhausted anymore. And we've tried adding all of these other um, stimuli, really, these other ways of releasing their brakes uh, to wake up these exhausted T cells and allow them to do their job, go and target tumor antigens. But the real problem is most of them don't know their job. They're exhausted and aren't specifically trained to kill cancer in the first place. So what we need to do, instead of emphasizing on just preventing their exhaustion, is to give them those orders, those correct orders in the first place. And the general of this immune army is the dendritic cell. He can cross-present those tumor antigens uh, to T cells in the first place um, and tell them what to do, what to go after. And because of this uh, power of the dendritic cell, he was, as I said, acknowledged in the 2011 Nobel Prize, uh, which was awarded to, to Ralph Steinman for the discovery of dendritic cells in their description, as well as to Drs. Butler and Hoffman, uh, who described toll-like receptors, as I said, important, important activating switches for dendritic cells. Um, and you know, while these guys were pivotal uh, in the description uh, here, you know, they still didn't get to fully realize the dream of using these cells and their activating switches um, for effective cancer immunotherapy. So we're trying to help towards that. And this is how important we think dendritic cells are in telling T cells what to do, um, that they really send uh, a sublime signal uh, to T cells uh, to activate them. And we're trying to exploit that exact concept. And as I said over the last couple of slides, if not enough dendritic cells is the cause of ineffective cancer immunotherapy, let's just be real simple and get more dendritic cells to the tumor. So I hinted already that we're using this recipe to accomplish that, using FLT3 to mobilize dendritic cells to the tumor, using low dose radiotherapy to release some tumor antigens to load those dendritic cells, and a toll-like receptor agonist, poly-IC is a TLR3 agonist to activate those dendritic cells. Mobilize DC, load DC, activate DC. And at the end of that, you have a dendritic cell that's activated with a tumor antigen. That is the vaccine. This is not a preventative vaccine. This is a therapeutic vaccine. But that vaccine is not made in a lab or a factory. That vaccine is made at the site of a tumor. So we call this uh, in situ vaccination. Uh, and the concept here is that we could teach the immune system at this one site how to respond to uh, cancers throughout the body. Therefore, when we look at remissions, we ignore the fact that this tumor might melt. That could just be from the radiotherapy. But when we see distant tumors melting away, what we sometimes call abscopal regressions or abscopal responses, at least that's pretty suggestive to us uh, of a, that, that we've induced a systemic anti-tumor immune response. Um, so we only indu uh, call clinical response assessments uh, at distant sites. Uh, this is the concept. We've been very lucky to be able to, bring, to put this into practice. This trial has been open now for a few years. Uh, this trial would not have been possible without some very generous uh, donors who helped to pay for it over at Damon Runyon, and absolutely would not be possible without a product uh, of Mount Sinai, Dr. Tom Marin, uh, who has spent his whole life at Mount Sinai, medical school, PhD, uh, residency, fellowship, and now he's a member of the faculty. Tom basically is Mount Sinai. So uh, he has been uh, critical in helping uh, us to treat these patients and just give a one uh, backdrop of some of the preclinical work uh, that helped to facilitate this trial. Uh, and this is the simplest uh, piece of data that when we inject FLT3 into mouse tumors, these mouse tumors, as you can see, are initially devoid of anything but tumor cells. All the blue is tumor. But after FLT3L injections, um, those tumors are now infiltrated with dendritic cells, as you see in red. And many of those dendritic cells, dendritic cells expressing toll-like receptor 3, as I hinted here in yellow. And that's you know, not just interesting about those dendritic cells. That's actionable, because that's how we're going to activate these dendritic cells using a toll-like receptor 3 agonist. So the concept and a lot more data was shown in this preclinical model. I won't show any more mouse data. This is medicine grand rounds. Uh, I'll just, I'll mention the, uh, uh, the publication where you can go and look at all that data afterwards. Uh, and we brought this into the clinical concept where we use the same approach of in situ vaccination uh, for patients with low-grade lymphoma. This first bit of data is showing really the same thing. These are markers for dendritic cells. And we saw that uh, after FLT3 ligand therapy, our patients had many of these, um, we call them CD1, CD141 dendritic cells. They are almost synonymous with bad F3 dendritic cells. Uh, and as you can see, these dendritic cells express high levels of toll-like receptor 3, similar to what we saw in the preclinical model. This is uh, mass cytometry cytop data, very, very fancy version of really something like flow cytometry data. And the colors here are just fold change of uh, these patients um, after FLT3 ligand compared to before. So red is a many fold increase because this is a long scale, blue is a relative decrease. And really the punchline here is that FLT3 ligand by itself increases proportions of dendritic cells of a few types 
It increases a couple of other myeloid cells a little bit, but mostly doesn't affect the proportions of other cells in the body. So FLT3 ligand increases dendritic cells, especially cross-presenting dendritic cells. And really this is partly a plug uh, for the human immune monitoring core. We are extremely lucky at Mount Sinai to have this immune monitoring core run by professors Murad and Rahman and, and Sasha Nyatik. And uh, we are one of four centers in the country that have a, a NIH U24 funded um, immune monitoring core. Uh, centers are Dana-Farber, Mount Sinai, Stanford, and MD Anderson. This is relevant well beyond cancer immunotherapy. Anyone in medicine that is thinking about novel therapies for their patients or novel patients in a particular situation and want to understand the immunology of what's happening in those patients, you can see here we can get at a glance almost the whole story of a patient's immune system uh, at that time. So the immune monitoring core is an incredible resource without which we would not be able to understand uh, the effects of these novel therapies that we're trying. And I'll just give you a couple of quick punchline clinical results from this uh, first in situ vaccine trial. So I'm showing you bulky tumors in patients with low-grade lymphoma. This is coronal imaging showing that this patient has a nice left internal jugular and carotid, but you can't see any on the right side because they are squished by this giant tumor that we see here coronally um, and also transversely. Giant tumor squishing the vasculature closed uh, so this is not just a little bit of cancer. These are also giant, uh, large, bulky uh, uh, external iliac uh, lymph nodes uh, filled with tumor. All of these sites are far away from the left inguinal site that we treated with the in situ vaccine. You see that now the person has a left jugular vein. That large tumor is still there, but much, much smaller uh, on both uh, types of imaging. Now the vasculature has opened up. Those bulky iliac tumors now almost completely regressed. Uh, this is a patient with such advanced stage lymphoma that they actually have leukemic phase lymphoma. Leukemic phase meaning that the lymphoma cells are in their blood. Uh, I lost a label here. This is CD19 on the y-axis. So these are all B cells. These are the patient's T cells. And opposed, uh, in contrast to most of us, I hope, uh, this patient has more B cells in their blood than T cells because almost all of these B cells are his cancerous B cells. And again, we didn't inject the blood. We injected this tumor. And we're very lucky for low-grade lymphoma to have chemotherapy, which doesn't cure the patients, but can put them into temporary remission. Uh, however, when chemotherapy kills cancerous B cells, it kills healthy T cells at the same time. By contrast here, we see the patient after vaccine, cancerous B cells melting away, uh, healthy T cells spared. And even months after the vaccine is done, cancerous B cells uh, melting away even more, uh, sparing healthy T cells. I'm just gonna show that exact same data in a slightly different way. Now we're looking at the patient's B cells, their healthy B cells, which are lambda expressing B cells, compared to kappa expressing B cells. All of their lymphoma B cells express kappa light chain. Their healthy B cells express uh, lambda light chain. And as you can see, almost all the B cells in their blood are cancerous B cells. And we're also lucky in this disease to have rituximab, which doesn't cure this disease, but puts people into temporary remission sometimes. And rituximab, while it kills cancerous B cells, kills healthy B cells at exactly the same rate or even a bit faster. Here, the therapy is killing cancerous B cells, as I showed you above, but healthy B cells actually increasing in proportion, they are spared. So what are the antigens that we are targeting with this in situ vaccine? We don't even know for this patient. We are still trying to find that out. Um, we don't have to know the antigens for the immune system to know the antigens, uh, fortunately. Uh, I'll give one more example of another patient with uh, advanced stage follicular lymphoma. This is such advanced stage that all the black you see here on this page, except for the heart, and the bladder and a little bit of the kidney collecting ducts here. Uh, all the black otherwise is uh, her advanced stage lymphoma. Now I was given permission by her to say that she's actually a nurse that works here in this hospital. Uh, and uh, she's had this lymphoma for a few years. Uh, we treated her with this in situ vaccine. So this inguinal tumor right here. And afterwards she had a profound regression of almost all the sites, not everything. You see there's a little bit of cancer left over in a few of these spots, even a, lift, a bit left over in one of these axillary nodes, but this was about an 85% regression and still the only black you see now left. And I'm just gonna show you, we're not hiding any uh, tumor behind the heart, kidneys or bladder. Uh, so it was a profound regression. Uh, we had a number of other patients with uh, systemic uh, regression. Some of those remissions lasted for months or years. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is all published data now. We published this about a year ago. Uh, so everyone can go look at the, both the mouse preclinical data uh, and these early clinical results. Um, using the immune monitoring core, we're able to dig a bit deeper into what's happening at the tumor site. So we're gonna do biopsies um, of both the untreated sites before therapy and afterwards. Again, these are sites that we did not uh, treat with the in situ vaccine. These are distant sites. So just at the simplest level of immunistic chemistry, uh, we see that prior to the vaccine, 
the tumor parenchyma has very few T cells in it. There are some uh, T cells in the interstitium, but we always imagine that these T cells want to get in here to attack the tumor, but are not sufficiently activated to do so. They're not primed for anti-tumor effect. Uh, but after the vaccine, again, these, these, these tumors far away from the treated site have CD8 T cells flooding into them. Presumably they are the cause of the tumor regression. That's easy to prove in the mouse model. Uh, it's just a correlation here in, the, in our patients, but we think that's the cause of uh, the tumor regressions. And again, we can do cytoff data, this very fancy mass cytometry to look at all the different types of immune cells uh, in the tumor. Again, color is full change after the therapy compared to before. And the big punchlines here are that regulatory T cells in the tumor have actually decreased uh, significantly and many different types of CDA T cells and NK cells have proportionally increased. And that's mostly good news, but there's some actually concerning news here. One of the T cell subtypes that have increased are these exhausted T cells. When we say exhausted, we mean they express high levels of PD-1 and some other exhaustion markers. So that may be an actionable thing. I'll get back to that in, in just a second. Um, just a second is now. So we went back when we saw this uh, exhaustion of T cells at the tumor site, uh, we went back to the animal model one more time uh, to see if we could actually actionably um, in, improve this therapy uh, by preventing the exhaustion of those T cells. So in addition to the PD-1 expressed by the T cells you saw in the prior slide, going back to the mouse model, you can see that the tumor cells themselves start to express PD-L1. So all of the yellow orange you see here are tumor cells expressing PD-L1 after the in situ vaccine, not before. And the red are myeloid cells expressing PD-L1. So both the tumor cells and some of the infiltrating myeloid cells are preventing T cells uh, from their optimal effect here. And so we did what was really at this point the obvious thing, which is we added PD-1 blockade to the vaccine where the vaccine itself was curing a little bit less than half of these uh, mice adding anti-PD-1, now the vaccine is curing about, the vaccine plus anti-PD-1 is curing about 85% of these mice. So uh, a significant difference and sufficiently inspirational to us to go from that first trial I mentioned now to a newer trial, which has opened uh, kind of recently. We've treated the first few patients, combining the vaccine with an anti-PD-1 antibody, and now we'll be treating patients with lymphoma and breast cancer and head and neck cancer. And again, this is the, the basic principle learning lessons in one tumor type, trying to bring them to all, all types of cancer. So that trial is ongoing. Certainly if you have patients with these types of cancer, we'd be delighted to meet them and talk about their eligibility for the study. Um, I'll just give a couple of quick examples of how ways in which we're trying to improve uh, this anti-cancer vaccine, this therapeutic in situ vaccine. Um, specifically, you saw that we mobilized dendritic cells, we loaded them with antigen, and then we activated them uh, with uh, this we call synthetic toll-like receptor, toll receptor agonist. The poly-IC is just a little stretch of RNA that looks like viral RNA and it activates these immune cells. But you know that's not how the immune system evolved to respond to this synthetic molecule poly-IC. The immune system evolved to respond to pathogens. So we had an idea, you know, this guy, William Coley, back 120 years ago was literally putting pathogens into people's tumors. We didn't think the IRB would be really up for that at this point, uh, and, and rightfully so. But we have a whole bunch of pathogens sitting downstairs in the pharmacy. They are either attenuated or killed. These are all the prophylactic pathogen vaccines that we use every day. Uh, and these things are full of toll-like receptor agonists. They're full of viral RNA, viral DNA, bacterial uh, cell membrane components. So we just took all 20 of them and exposed them to these mobilized dendritic cells. And here we have some more uh, high dimensional um, single cell immune cell monitoring data showing that basically the punchline here is that most of the dendritic cells are on this side, what we call here a Visney plot. Dendritic cells are here, other cell types here. And these dendritic cells are getting very activated. You can see them turning red by either BCG, one of the oldest pathogen vaccines that we have, and also by uh, Haemophilus influenza vaccine, PEDVAX, uh, these dendritic cells are getting highly activated by these standard, we call them um, natural PRR agonists as opposed to synthetic PRR agonists. So we have this panel of natural PRR agonists. We want to see if they could be better than the synthetic ones we've been using in the clinic already. This would be great because uh, to be fair, there's an uh, intertwining of medicine and capitalism and every company that we have to get these not approved medicines from, they have their own agenda. That's fine. Mostly their agenda is to help us to help people. But these naturally, these natural PR agonists are almost almost freely available. These vaccines mostly cost 
uh, $20 per vial. Some of them cost $200 per vial. And we don't have to go to any company to get access to these. You know, to be fair, uh, the huge advances uh, in medicine and immunotherapy have helped many people, but they haven't helped everybody equally. We have many underserved people that we would like to develop these therapies, but still develop them uh, in a feasible way that we can get everybody access to them. So one of the concepts here is about you know, using what the immune system is more naturally responsive to, natural PR agonists. And, and also there's a concept of making these things feasible and available. So we saw that these 20 vaccines, some of them could be highly potent in activating uh, dendritic cells. Um, we did some extremely fancy math only a fraction of which I understand, but we looked at every, every single metric of activation from all of these different vaccines. And we observed that different vaccines activate dendritic cells in different ways. We did something called principal component analysis to try to understand the sum of all of those ways in which these different vaccines activate dendritic cells. Although PEDVAX and BCG both activate dendritic cells, they activate them in very different ways. So we made what we thought was a rational combinations uh, of triplets of these natural PRR agonists. And you can see going back to the animal model, this uh, triplet of what we think is a, a rational uh, combination of three different NAPR agonists, natural PR agonists, uh, was pretty good uh, at curing mice of, this, um, bulk, of these bulky tumors in the context of the insight to vaccine. So this is one, that one way that we're trying to improve the vaccine. Um, and one last way is that although we're using these therapies now to um, load the dendritic cell with antigens and activate them, we thought we might be able to get around that with one, similar, one single approach using a, a, an oncolytic virus called Newcastle disease virus. So we worked with Alfonso um, Garcia Sastre and Peter Palesi who've been developing this uh, oncolytic virus. And here again, the concept was that the uh, oncolytic virus can both load the dendritic cells with tumor antigens and activate them at the same time. I'll skip some of this data, but we saw, saw the same thing happening in the dendritic cells both of our FLT3 uh, ligand treated mice and dendritic cells from our FLT3 ligand treated patients. Um, and we were able to discover a very cool thing here. I said in one of those patients that ultimately we don't know which antigens we are training the immune system to go after, but here we were able to do something called neoepitope discovery. We sequenced the entire tumor um, from these mouse tumors. We found which mutations might be the ones that the immune system is responding to. And we actually found that it was one very specific uh, peptide called LR. LRRK1, uh, which is the actual oncogene driving uh, these tumors forward, is the uh, mutated uh, epitope to which these immune responses are responding. And we see those immune responses uh, here with the uh, oncolytic virus um, in situ vaccine. And again, we see with that same approach, we are now curing uh, with the in situ virus, in situ vaccine uh, using the oncolytic virus, uh, both flooding into those tumors of T cells uh, here in violet and curing of the majority of those mice. So a couple of ways that we're trying to improve the insight to vaccine uh, in the lab, just going back to that same patient I showed you a moment ago. I showed you that we were bringing T cells into that patient's tumor. I'll show you something else about that tumor that we see when we do this deeper immune monitoring with the immune monitoring core, uh, which is that even while these tumors are regressing, uh, we see the proportion of cancer cells in those tumors are regressing. They are physically regressing and the proportion of tumor cells therein is proportionally going down, um, again, by this CYTOF data. However, the proportion of healthy B cells is uh, relatively increasing. This is similar to what I showed you in that leukemic phase lymphoma patient where the healthy B cells are spared and the cancerous B cells are being eliminated. That's all good news. There's some bad news here on the same uh, piece of data, which is that there's a subset of cancer cells which are proportionally increasing and they have lost MHC class one, the HLA molecules that present tumor antigens. And this is a serious problem, not just for this vaccine, but we think for every type uh, of cancer immunotherapy, every type of immunotherapy is going after some antigens, whether they are intracellular expressed on class one or their surface antigens like CD20. Still antigen loss is a critical weakness of cancer immunotherapy. So we are observing that here in this patient of ours who I mentioned, and if she were to eventually progress uh, it could be that this um, HLE loss, that this MHC class one lost clone uh, for cancer cells is what is progressing. So we will see that um, if it were to happen. Um, and this is not a unique thing to our vaccine. Uh, this MHC loss is one of the most famous causes of antigen escape and progression in all types of uh, cancer immunotherapy, such as PD-1 blockade. So Dr. Zaretsky's group published this in New England Journal four years ago already. Patients receiving, these are melanoma patients receiving um, anti-PD-1 antibodies, having good clinical responses, but as they relapse, 
you see that MHC1 is completely lost. They cannot present uh, their own tumor antigens to T cells that would be attacking them. And so this is a big problem. I'm just gonna do the last uh, 10 minutes uh, of the talk about a way that we're trying to address this problem of antigen escape. And, and the problem here is that once these cells have lost these antigens, you know, how can you still use immunotherapy to attack them? So it is very hard to think about how we can treat this antigen loss tumor. However, we, we don't wanna treat it. What we'd actually really like to do is to prevent this antigen loss tumor. Because if you go back to these tumors before the therapy, you can see there are a couple of these antigen low cells, MHC1 low cells already there before. All we've done is enrich for them by giving uh, this T cell mediated therapy. So if we could somehow target these MHC, these antigen loss cells, uh, even before they escape, we think that would be a better solution to the problem than trying to treat them afterwards. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how the lab is thinking about how we can prevent uh, antigen escape, not by targeting um, their MHC1 uh, with a peptide as we've been doing, not by targeting CD19 as CAR T cells do, not by targeting CD20 as bispecific antibodies do, but instead targeting their, uh, excuse me, instead by targeting their geography. And I'll describe what I mean by that. Mostly what we just mean is that although they have none of these markers, perhaps these antigen loss cells, they do have a unique geography. They are surrounded by antigen positive cells. So we wanna to try to exploit something called bystander killing to target that, uh, that fact. And again, I won't give too much data about other uh, therapy types, but CAR T cells are famous for having a problem of CD19 loss, antigen loss. One way that people are trying to treat this a very thoughtful way is to go after new antigens like CD22 or other antigens that may be on these cells. Um, the problem is when some of these uh, cancer cells lose CD19 and escape from CAR T cell therapy, this probably happens about a third of the time. Um, in fact, they can lose some of these other markers as well, uh, blue and red or before and after therapy here. They can lose all of these differentiation B cell markers concurrently because it's part of a whole transcriptomic programmatic switch um, to de-differentiate. So just treating these people after they relapse with an anti-CD22 CAR T cell might not be sufficient. They may have uh, escaped uh, sensitivity to all of those uh, antigen-based attacks. Uh, again, hence our interest in trying to uh, use geography to prevent these antigen escapes. And all of, almost all of this work was done by a brilliant MD-PhD student who's now finishing up um, his fourth year in medical school uh, here at Sinai, Ranjan Apadie. So I'll be showing a lot of his work. Uh, again, the concept here is that we have T cells that kill based on antigens loaded in MHC. We have CAR T cells that kill sometimes based on surface antigens like CD19. Um, and they're pretty good and they kill mostly using granzyme and perforin uh, as I showed before, except we'll, except we'll always have some out of a billion or 10 billion cancer cells, we will always have at least one or two of them that do not have those antigens on their surface. So those antigen loss cells will progress and cause the eventual relapse we call antigen escape. What we'd like to think about is perhaps there's some magical receptor on some of these cancer cells. And I will just tell you that this magical receptor from Ranjan's discovery is gonna be fast, something that we've learned about before. But if there was a magical receptor that could still uh, allow these um, bystander cells, this is the on-target cell, this is a bystander cell. If there was something that could facilitate bystander killing of this antigen loss cell, we could hopefully kill mostly with perforin and granzyme, but also send a death signal to these antigen loss cells and prevent antigen escape. So that's the concept that we can use geography, the proximity of the on-target cell to the bystander cell to allow them both to be killed. And I just have to say that Ranjan came upon this um, not through the consequence of an intended search. We were actually trying to ask a completely different question. Uh, the question we were asking was, how do T cells kill on target cells, not bystander cells? And we really serendipitously stumbled into this um, bystander killing result. So uh, Ranjan took a, uh, a very cool reagent invented by uh, Brian Brown lab uh, next door to mine, uh, which is an anti-green T cell that we use in the mice. Uh, anti-green meaning it's against a green protein, GFP, that we can put into uh, lymphoma cells. So we put green into some lymphoma cells and just to have some bystander cells nearby, we put red into other lymphoma cells and we let the anti-green T cells kill those green lymphoma cells. But before we did that, uh, Ranjan developed a library of 2,400 different CRISPRs to knock out different um, genes in both these green and red cells, which would possibly uh, prevent the T cells uh, from killing effectively or perhaps facilitate better killing. And so I won't go through 
that algorithm of how we perform this uh, CRISPR library screen, I'll just go to the punchline here, that many genes, that if you knock them out of the green tumor cells, the T cells can no longer kill them. The obvious one is beta 2M, which is MHC class one. Without class one, T cells cannot kill their target cell. So that was the positive control that spiked into this library. An interesting thing here was, I'll just give a couple of examples on the bottom side. These things would be things like PDL1. When you knock out a brake pedal that stops T cells from killing, when it's gone, now the T cells kill better. So the screen discovers things that facilitate T cell, uh, things that facilitate T cell killing, and things that prevent T cell killing, like PDL1, which is actually one of these dots over here. So something that was surprising to us, even though it made sense, was that FAST, FAST has been described for many decades now. Uh, to facilitate T cell killing of tumor cells. But what surprised us was how powerful it was because it's supposed to be a minor part of how T cells kill tumor cells. I'll show you how powerful it was. So this, instead of the whole library, is just a single example of one of those genes being knocked out fast. So the, the killing assay, it's quite simple. We have the green lymphoma cells, the red lymphoma cells. We add anti-GFP T cells and this 50-50 mixture roughly goes down so that the green cells are getting killed. Um, and that's how it's supposed to work. However, when you knock fast out of these green cells, they seem to not get killed at all. Even though perforin and granzyme and all the other killing mechanisms are still here, without fast, it seems like these T cells are completely unable to kill these tumor cells. That's how it appeared to us. Uh, and just to clarify, the T so this is looking at the lymphoma cells in these killing assays. I'll just show you a picture of the T cells. This is more flow cytometry data showing that t these T cells are going to proliferate and degranulate and spit out granzyme, whether they're killing the normal green cancer cells or if they're killing fast lost green cancer cells. The T cells are still doing their job. They are spitting out granzyme and yet these green lymphoma cells without fast appear to be completely resistant to getting killed. And this is the thing that then prompted us to do a next experiment which caused us to stumble in to this, this, this discovery of bystander cell killing. The fact that these T cells are actually killing both the on-target cell and the bystander cell. So this next experiment, we just made all versions um, of those cells I mentioned, green lymphoma cells versus red and cells that all of which either had FAS or were CRISPR deleted for FAS. So we have all four versions of the cells here. Now we're just gonna look in each of them at the deathiness, cleav cleavage of caspases and early onset um, death uh, marker. And as we add the anti-green T cells, we see the green lymphoma cells starting to die but only if they have FAST, without FAST, they don't die at all. And we actually see the red cells, the bystander cells also starting to get killed. This didn't make sense to us. They're not, they're not supposed to get killed. They're supposed to, supposed to be quiet bystanders, but they're getting killed as well. And they're only getting killed if FAST is present uh, in the populations in which FAST is present. So this is a test tube. It really doesn't matter because you know T cell killing in a test tube doesn't tell you what's happening uh, in a real living thing. So we went to a real living thing we gave these mice 50-50 tumors, half targetable by anti-green T cells, half of them bystander cells. And what we saw, and then we did both versions where the bystander cells either were wild type or had lost, uh, we CRISPRed out uh, the FAST gene from the bystander cells. And what we saw, you can look at these red cells. These are bystander cells that should not get killed um, by an anti-green T cell. And actually, if you have the red tumors by themselves, they don't get touched at all by these uh, anti-green T cells. But if there's a green target cell right next door to these red cells, these red cells, the white here is their expression of this caspase uh, activation, meaning that they are getting killed. So these bystander cells are getting killed in a tumor. Um, and in fact, if the bystander cells don't have FAS uh, in a parallel uh, mouse, those by the, all the caspase cells you see here are not bystander cells, they're all the green cells. So if you have FAST in a bystander cell, it can get killed. Um, this is true microscopically. This is true macroscopically. The same experiment with the mixed tumors where the bystander cell doesn't have FAST. We give anti-GFP T cells to these mixed tumors. Tumors grow for a bit while the T cells are dividing. And then these tumors start to shrink. This 50-50 tumor, half and half, doesn't shrink by 50%. It shrinks by much more than 50%. It seems to us like these bystander cells are getting killed. We've talked really in immunology about bystander killing for really a couple of decades, but it has never been uh, mechanistically uh, shown to be um, related to one gene in vivo. So that's the novel finding here. When we give a 50-50 tumor, anti-tumor T cells, it shrinks by more than half. And yet if the bystander cells don't express fast, it shrinks by exactly half. 
it seems like they are now the anti green T cells are killing just their target and unable to kill the bystander cells. Um, okay, it's all very uh, interesting. Does it actually relate to our patients? We we're able to work with the, one of those big CAR T companies that I mentioned, Kite Gilead, uh, and get some of the tumor data from this first registrational uh, CAR T trial I mentioned. And the interesting thing from the trial is even though it's an anti CD19 CAR T cell, um, still patients that went into remission or patients that were refractory to the therapy had about the same amount of CD19 in their tumors. It's unintuitive. It's surprising to us. Uh, we can talk about why that might be. Um, by contrast, patients who went into remission had more FAST in their tumors than patients that were refractory to the therapy. It does seem like FAST is relevant uh, in living humans treated with T-cell therapy, just like the mice I showed in the prior slide. Um, and it's not just the chance of going and having a, a clinical response the chance of maintaining that response. Patients whose tumors had the highest amount of FAST from this uh, large CAR-T trial uh, were more likely to stay in remission. And really these CAR-T remissions that last more than a year, as I said, we think these are generally cures. So patients with more FAST in their tumors were more likely to be cu cured. And when we saw this, we thought, well, it's just because FAST is a death receptor. So having more in your tumor must be good. It turns out that's only true if you're getting T-cell therapy. If you're getting standard therapy, this is just historical data uh, from public uh, TCGA database. Uh, and patients with more fast in their tumor did not do well. In fact, it's only when they got T-cell therapy, CAR T-cells in this case, uh, that the fast high tumors, uh, those patients did well. So it does seem to be relevant for our patients, not just for uh, mice that we're treating. And all of this uh, calculation um, and uh, bioinformatics work was done with the help of our colleague, Dr. Samir Parekh. Uh, whose lab is on the other side of my lab. And I want to show you one more thing about this data that I showed you that we're inducing on target uh, tumor killing and bystander tumor killing. And, it, and that the fact that it is exquisitely fast dependent. This is a bit academic. It's just an observation. The reason it's exciting to us is that we know a lot about how fast signals. So if we could just make fast signal better, we could get even more of this bystander killing. We think this is probably already happening to some degree, but if we want to prevent antigen escape, we'd like to potentiate bystander killing. And because many people have worked hard to understand how fast works, perhaps we can do that. Many of these regulators of fast signaling are already things that we have either FDA approved small molecule inhibitors or many things that are in clinical trials for our patients. So we tried to improve, potentiate fast signaling to see if it will increase bystander uh, tumor cell killing. And we have a number of examples of that. And we've published all, I'm sorry, we will be publishing all of these in about um, two weeks, I think. Uh, this paper was accepted recently. And I'll just show you one example. When we use this HDAC inhibitor, something called panabinostat, we pour panabinostat on all of these tumor cells, cells that are green, tumors that are red, they do have FAST or they don't have FAST. HDAC inhibitor, panabinostat, does not increase the deathiness of any of those tumor cells. However, when we add HDAC inhibitor plus the anti-tumor T cells, um, we see that now we have much better on-target killing, fast mediated, and much more bystander killing. And again, it's only happening in the cells that have fast, uh, completely lost in cells that don't have fast. Um, Jim, I've got maybe four or five minutes left. I'm gonna say one other project we're doing in the lab, um, and then we'll have, I still think, three and a half minutes for questions. Good? Thumbs up. Um, so all of this stuff is very far along, uh, and I'm really showing years of work of the folks in the lab and in our clinical research group, uh, for which we're very lucky. I want to say that these things are not simple, and they start much earlier than that. So I'll show one other project that Runchen was also working on uh, that's made amazing progress, but still has a little bit of ways to go. So this is another one of those same anti-green T-cell uh, killing assays. We put green lymphoma and red lymphoma, and we call this one vanilla lymphoma. We didn't put any color in it. And as we add anti-green T cells, although these mixtures are a third, a third, a third in the beginning, every day into the assay, you see these green cells getting killed. So that is green cancer getting killed by anti-green T cells um, as it should. And at the end of a week, almost all of those cancer cells can be killed by these T cells, but a couple of them seem to survive and they could survive in a few ways. One way is they could just lose their greenness, lose their GFP, and then they would hide from hide from these T cells in that way, or they could lose MHC class one and hide from the T cells in that way. So what Ranjan did, and it's just you know, simple and brilliant, it just took this, Dar this Darwinian approach of these guys have survived in some way, we don't know what that way is, but let's take those surviving cells, put them back into the assay all over again, and that we call a second generation of resistance. 
And the second generation resistant cells, cancer cells, were no more resistant to T cell attack. He did it a third time, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. By the time he got up to the eighth generation of resistant uh, green cancer cells, they were completely resistant um, to attack by these T cells. We've got lots of data about that, but I'm gonna show you just one video of that. Let me just explain the video first. We have these parental green lymphoma cells that I described, these cells here, and then the eighth generation resistance cell, it's equally green. You can see it's greenness here on the flow cytometry, but we added a yellow dye on top of it just so we could distinguish them under the microscope. And all of these other T cells attacking them, see how the sensitive cancer cell, the T cells are freaking out and they're running around and killing it. And in three seconds, this T cell is gonna explode that green cancer cell. And, and this resistance cell, if you've been watching it, the T cells are kind of falling asleep while they're trying to attack it. And this resistance cell could sit here all day, all week. In fact, this is a week's worth of video that I'm showing you and the T cells will never get, these, these uh, tumor cells will never get killed. So how are these lymphoma cells resistant? Obviously this would be relevant for our patients who many of whom have T cell resistant cancers. So we don't know how this uh, resistant cell derived from the parental cell differs so we asked um, 20,000 questions about how it might be different. We did transcriptomics to look at every transcript in the resistant tumors, the eighth, seventh, and sixth generation versus the parental generation. We found a bunch of transcripts which were enriched in the uh, resistant T cells, the T cell resistant tumor cells, excuse me. Uh, and then we just started CRISPRing those candidates out one by one. This is a, a huge amount of work uh, that Ranjan was working on for years. And here's the punchline of some of that work. The assay that I showed you is when you add T cells, anti-green T cells, the green cells go from 50-50. Uh, this is a four day assay, they get killed a fair bit. The resistant cells I showed you, after four days, they don't get killed at all. And when you CRISPR out one of these transcripts here, maybe it's the cause of resistance. Uh, this was transcript we call number 18. Now these tumor cells are not completely sensitive to T cell attack, but mostly sensitive to T cell attack. And this is the version in the test tube. And this is the same result and as, as Ranjan injected those uh, tumors into mice. The parental cell uh, gets treated quite well by uh, anti-green anti T cells. The resistant cells uh, escape T cell attack. And once we've CRISPRed out that target, uh, those uh, tumors again are sensitive to T cell uh, therapy. So uh, we still have a lot of work to prove that this novel target uh, is important. We're working with the patent lawyers here and a couple of other folks and excited to hopefully prove that this will be the next thing that we can bring to the clinic. And I'm going to stop there. I have to thank, of course, all of the scientists that help us to accomplish all of this, uh, the folks that give us all the money to do all of this work, uh, which is quite a bit, um, all the patients on these studies that I showed you, uh, the folks in the lab and the folks in our clinical research team that allow us to do these trials. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Josh. <clears throat> There uh, we're close to the end, but there's some questions in the chat if you can see them. Let me try to read those quickly. So first question, if you do not discuss CAR and K by the end, please do so. Include off the shelf efficacy cost as compared to CAR T. Beautiful new, um, I, you know, I, it's as though Milagros was the asker, but um, in, in case it wasn't, I'll just say it for everyone. So uh, CAR NK, beautiful publication, New England Journal of Medicine. Um, uh, about three months ago from the uh, brilliant team and down at MD Anderson uh, and Baylor works on this as well. Um, the concept is that maybe we don't need a T cell um, because a T cell, if you used it in a uh, allogeneic way, used an off the shelf uh, CAR T cell, an allogeneic CAR T cell that you don't have to make for each patient um, that an NK cell might be better because it wouldn't cause graft versus host disease if we use an allogeneic natural killer cell instead of a T cell. I'll give you my honest opinion. The concept of an allogeneic NK cell, CAR NK cell, or an allogeneic CAR T cell, um, elegant, um, it is the future, but that future is nowhere near where we are now. The New England Journal of Medicine publication was wonderful, but um, was not quite as impressive in the clinical responses um, as the abstract would convey. Um, all those patients were getting, most of those patients were getting other therapies as well. Um, allogeneic CAR T and CAR NK therapies are the future but they are not the two, three, four, or five year future. We have a lot of improvements we have to do in preventing graft versus host with that product and also preventing mostly elimination of that product um, we call graft rejection. So a lot of work still to go. Um, how would you continue to combine with the available PD-1 blockers? Uh, Richard Meyer. 
if we're talking about the vaccine, really the answer is, yeah, we're trying the vaccine now in combination with pembrolizumab, anti-PD-1 antibody, uh, treated a few patients with lymphoma, breast and head and neck cancer. And we're gonna try to open that trial up. It's open here. We're gonna try to open it up at Dana-Farber in the next few months. So hopefully we can do these trials more quickly because uh, getting the trials done is the most important thing in answering the question. From Malagros, to kill bystander cells, could one conjugate radioisotopes to an antibody? Absolutely. We have radioisotope conjugated antibodies. Um, the problem there really is um, the geographic limitation. It's hard to get radioisotopes to irradiate and kill just the cancer cell next door and not kill the cell uh, five away and the cell 20 away. So for example, we have two FDA approved radioisotope conjugated antibodies for lymphoma, but we cannot use them if someone has any significant amount of lymphoma in their bone marrow because the radioisotope would kill the lymphoma cell, kill the cell next door and kill most of the marrow. So there's a real spatial limitation to using radioisotopes, although that's such an elegant idea. If you could make the alpha or beta emitter gamma emitter only go exactly one cell away, ah, that would be a super elegant. So Milagro's uh, brilliant question uh, limited a little bit in what we can do right now, I would say. Great, Josh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, we're a little bit over, but you got done your questions and thank you for a really extensive review of your work and your collaborator's work it was really wonderful to hear. So. On behalf of the department, thanks very much. David, thank Have a you. good day, everybody. Enjoy. See you all.